and now for our next, well, after this, uh, I wanted to remind everybody that after this panel session, there's going to be a keynote, keynote presentation by Javier Tebas. So anybody who, who needs automatic translation from Spanish to English, please raise their hands and we will provide the headset for it. Um, so yeah, for our next panel called European Collaborative Model Participation, uh, we have, please welcome, Peter Fusek, President of the Football Association of the Czech Republic. Tomas Barta, CEO of the Czech League. Michael Mertiniak, Executive Director of the Slovakian League. Jean-Francois Broca, Associate Professor and Economist at the Center for Law and Economics of Sport of the University of Limoges. And the moderator of this panel, Jaime Dominguez, Chief Marketing Officer of World Football Summit. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. For me, it's an honor to be here with these wonderful panelists and to talk about the keys to preserve the European collaborative model in football. Um, I think I want to start, Thomas, talking about the basics. Um, the pillars of the European football model, you know, which are economic, social, and youth development, and, and as Thomas in the previous panel was mentioning, um, it goes beyond football. It goes into the health of the players, it goes into much more than that. So, which of these three pillars would be most impacted by the implementation of a Super League? I think... Uh it's uh, very, uh, very heavy to, to respond to uh, which of uh, those three pillars uh, will be uh, most impacted because uh, all three pillars are uh, connected together. Um, I'm afraid that uh, economic and uh, youth development uh, everywhere, not only in Czech Republic, but uh, everywhere in Europe, uh, will be uh, very heavily impacted uh, because uh, if uh, there, uh, there is a, a Super League, we can uh, forget to European, comp European club competitions as we know uh, last 60 years. Uh, for example, okay, can you imagine uh, or you know, do you know, do you know uh, it's, uh, Champions League in basketball? Uh -huh. No, there is only Europa League in basketball and Champions League. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. I think a key concept that you're mentioning is that all three pillars are interlinked, they're not independent from each other, and that's something that we need to consider, which is once you impact one, you're going to impact as a domino effect all the others, no? Um, and Jean-Francois, on, on that sense, you have um, co-written studies on this topic. Um, and both Ivan and Thomas were making reference in the previous panel that football goes um, or is embedded in the culture. Uh, and it touches upon, obviously, the values such as solidarity and integrity that we were mentioning, no? Um, and this is, these are two values that, in Europe in general, they want to promote. So, why is the current model more capable of delivering against those values than new proposed competitions like, for example, a Super League would do? To answer this question, we, we can observe what um, alternative models to the European sports model are, are doing at the moment. Because um, we already have in Europe um, competitions run by private market-driven organizers, such as the, what ECA is doing in basketball with the Euro League and Euro Cup. We also have the KHL, and I know that uh, Prague has a history with, the, with this high soccer competition. So those, those actors uh, did pretty much nothing and are doing nothing about solidarity. They don't share revenues with the grassroots. Um, they don't do much about the integrity. Um, just an anecdote, uh, when EuroLeague was launched, they didn't have any referees, they didn't have any um, doping controllers, and FIBA, uh, in its uh, great uh, um, honesty and uh, for the sake of players, made available some referees and some con doping controllers. So that was really like, that's what we can call free riding. You know, those actors arrived and didn't really take into account the integrity and solidarity. 
But in parallel, we can also check what the North American professional leagues are doing um, in solidarity and integrity. And um, it's also very interesting because they don't do anything about solidarity. They, but the best they do is called charity, but they don't share revenues with the grassroots at all. Um, and integrity, their approach is very, um, I want to say, opportunistic because they, they tackle doping and they tackle match fixing only when it has implications on revenues. It's not their motto. So those actors, um, dry, driven by revenues, they, they see solidarity and integrity as constraints so far. So there's no reason to believe that the, the Super League would be better uh, in this sense. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and Peter, one of the key factors um, that the current model has is that um, revenue from professional dis uh, competitions is then reinvested into football development. Um, so, for example, I think it's 97% of West Fire's revenues are reinvested directly back into sport, um, and this is set to increase. So, do you believe that new models like the European Super League um, would maintain that level of reinvestment in football development? Um, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone in uh, my home city and our, our beloved country. Uh, and we are grateful that uh, the conference is organized in Czech Republic. And uh, specifically to the question, uh, I'm very much in favor of the European sports model. Uh, not only as a person, but also as a UEFA Exco member and as a president of the Czech Football Association from two reasons. First of all, our system is unique. Uh, we have a pyramid where the, the, starting from the grassroots, youth education, until the competitions and also the distribution of financial funding. Um, the system is perfectly set. Uh, and if the Super League would be, would be established, then the whole pyramid, whole system would be damaged. It would have a large impact to the European football. So this is the European perspective. But also from the side of the national association, I have to uh, admit and stress out because sometimes the people feel, even in the middle-sized and small-sized associations, that if the Super League created by the big clubs has no link uh, to the smaller countries, it's a, this is a big mistake because we would be heavily impact. The Sparta, Slavia, Victoria, Pilsen, they would never be able to compete on the top level. And also the UEFA solidarity financing system would be impacted. And then, okay, the major part is distributed between the clubs, but also the Czech Football Association is receiving uh, from Hattrick, uh, which is, thanks God, is increasing. Uh, and we can in, invest with the project and complete the cycle by the educating the youth, coaches, and so on. Thank you. You were speaking about the impact, no? And um, on that sense, um, KPMG, one of the biggest firms in the world, um, published some research looking at the impact that the European Super League would have, for example, in, in, in La Liga, no, in Spain. And it could be quite significant because some estimates actually speak about an impact in revenues of 50 to 55%, which is very big. Now, Michal, um, and maybe Thomas can weigh in on this question as well afterwards, but Michal, I want to understand, while there may not be a similar report in your league, um, how do you believe this impact would translate into your leagues? Mm. I would say significant, uh, indeed, because uh, the whole ecosystem is working uh, because of the fact that everyone from the ecosystem can take a part of it, meaning our clubs can compete on an international level, which is very important. Uh, with establishing a, a Super League model, that would uh, totally destroy the ecosystem, the whole ecosystem, meaning uh, our clubs, like Sloma Bratislava, Dunajska Streda or Spartak Trnava, they are keen to play Europe. European games, not only from the point of view that they are receiving uh, money from the European competitions, but even though uh, the interest in sports, in football is rising because of the international level, because of uh, playing internationally in European competitions. And it is a very crucial part of the whole ecosystem. So uh, for us, 
definitely it would be a significant uh, part of uh, of the of the whole ecosystem that would be destroyed by uh, by such a uh, such a decision and i would say that uh, such a closed competition um, has no clue in europe because europe is totally different to uh, what the colleague uh, here was telling uh, mr Pro mr professor was telling about the ecosystem in in us is totally different sport it's about professional sport, not supporting uh, the grassroots, not supporting the whole pyramid, as Mr. Fosek was uh, speaking about. And I would say uh, this, let's say, social aspect within European football is very crucial. It's a crucial part of the whole ecosystem because it is built on that. We don't have any, uh, any uh, uh, college football. We don't have any, any sports in, uh, in the universities or in, uh, in schools. Uh, it is only done by football clubs, meaning if we do destroy the system, we destroy the whole ecosystem as a whole. So meaning this would totally damage, uh, damage every one of us. Um, I think uh, that the possibility of uh, ESL uh, it, uh, wouldn't be so great impact uh, as uh, for Spain, uh, Spanish club as, uh, because we have <laughs> We have Slavia Prague and Sparta Prague, but we have Barcelona, Real Madrid and Atletico Madrid. Uh, so our impacts to our competitions uh, wouldn't be so, so great, uh, but, uh, and I don't believe, I don't believe that uh, Slavia Prague and Sparta Prague would, uh, would join to some ridiculous competition as third or fourth division of, uh, <laughs> of Europe. Uh, but of course, uh, if uh, the Super ESL, Super ESL, would uh, play on uh, on weekend days, it will be problem for everyone in Czech Republic. Uh, indeed, and and to your point, Michal, what you were mentioning is it's not only the direct impact; it's also the indirect impact that is created because of the interest that football uh, generates. No, um, and John Francois, I um, from your point of view. Um, what are the reasons that justify that the current European football model is not broken? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first, I would mention that we are focusing on football today, but this issue has a broader, could have a broader impact because it's, um, this pyramid system, this European models, model, model is, is considering any sport, you know? So the decision of the court is going is to potentially impact all sports and not only football. But when it comes to football, we have the threats of renegade leagues, breakaway leagues from the last 30 years, and so far the models still stand. And uh, to me, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is that the, 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 the clubs that are launching those, those, um, those projects, there's just a handful of them first, so there's not a massive, massive global uh, will to, to fight Uf UEFA and to launch another, another competition. It's just the top clubs, so there's n the, the political impact is, is reduced so far. And then the, the other reason is that the plan B is never really, really well described. I mean, what's exactly the European Super League? Uh, I don't know. They don't know because they changed um, from one day to the other. And I, I think that they, they have doubts, all those clubs, they have doubts about the feasibility of the project and even about the profitability of the project because I'm personally not convinced that, they would, that clubs would make more money. Maybe the revenues would go higher, but definitely the cost as well. So I'm not personally convinced. And the last thing is that those clubs that launch those projects, they have different agendas. Uh, they are, there's clubs who have, which have a big local market, other clubs have a small, um, smaller market, uh, some clubs have really important domestic competitions, other clubs don't have those um, important domestic competitions, so it's very difficult for them to find a common ground and to, to present a project that is like uh, up, to, up to work. Um, so my, my opinion about this is that uh, the clubs really think that uh, the, 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 the grass is going to be greener, in alternative models, but so far I'm pretty sure that even them realize that maybe the, gra the, glass is, the grass is not going to be greener and they're pretty happy just threading from the inside be in, 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 and not being outside and, and living without any public support, any kind of institutions such as UEFA, which can help them, definitely.
Okay, understood. Thank you, Jim Francois. Um, I think here we can all agree that the uh, majority of professional football players, they don't reach the top, top, top level, right? But I think at the same time, um, those are the players that actually build the foundation of football. Um, so, Peter, I want to understand from your point of view, how would an initiative like the Super League impact those players, um, not only from an economic perspective, but also from a, call it performance perspective, because they effectively would play less games. So that would impact their career as well from, from, from that point of view. So, so what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I would like to e extend this area uh, not only to the players, but also dedicate it to maybe to, to some other areas, because if we are talking about uh, potential Super League, uh, we are discussing, okay, what should be the size of the competition, uh, the group, number of clubs, and so on. But as was already mentioned, there are many other links which are being forgotten, like grassroots, youth education, coaches, referees, extremely important area, uh, all the services around the competition and regarding players. Of course, the players, uh, because this is co connected with the calendar and the status of the players, uh, there will be a heavy impact, but mentioning the players, also the national teams would be seriously impacted. Uh, because if there is a, a new structure and not the system like we are having and we are very satisfied with, the, all the national teams uh, will, be, will be heavily impacted by the new competition. It goes back to what we were mentioning before, that this is an ecosystem that's connected throughout all of its pieces. So once you touch one lever, you're going to start impacting all of them. No? So, so that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and while doing research for this panel, um, I found uh, a stat that said that uh, for, for Czechside, and forgive me for my pronunciation here, but uh, for Jablonik's um, uh, vice president, what he was saying is that um, participating in European competitions uh, boost the annual budget by 8%. Um, now, Thomas, um, this refers to ticketing sales, partnerships, merchandising. So is there a general figure or a sense of how removing the four spots that the Czech League has, uh, so, uh, and that effectively, to give some context, is 25% of, of, of the league, no? those four spots, um, would impact Czech teams overall? Uh, FK Avelonitz is uh, a small club in Czech Republic. Of, of course, uh, against the, the, the Slavia or Sparta Prague, uh, and uh, if it boosts uh, budget uh, about 8%, I can imagine uh, that uh, for Slavia and Sparta Prague, uh, it would be higher. Uh, the impact uh, for the budget, and uh, if, uh, if we lose four, uh, four teams in uh, European club competitions, uh, it means that uh, it's uh, damage all ecosystem in Czech football, because uh, if uh, Slavia or Sparta are in uh, European club uh, competitions uh, or qualifications throughout uh, and, or in a uh, uh, stage uh, on, on group uh, on the group uh, stage uh, uh, they they develop uh, activity and uh, players market in uh, domestic competition in Czech Republic and uh, it would uh, damage everything in Czech Republic yeah well thank you for for that overview um, and the thing is between 2011 and 2022 almost 600 clubs from the 55 UEFA national associations um, have participated in European competition, no? Um, and this speaks to another uh, value that is present across football as we see it today, which is diversity. Um, so, Michal, on, on your perspective, what benefits does this diversity bring to your league that other models cannot? 
I think it's crucial. Uh, this ecosystem is bringing us a lot of opportunities because there is some, uh, let's say, direct impacts that we that we that we see with our clubs playing in European competitions, getting the revenues, uh, even uh, all the other clubs uh, taking uh, part of the solidarity, which is very important uh, to development of the whole ecosystem, uh, from uh, you know, UEFA solidarity uh, or even from uh, another programs like Hattrick and, and, and else. But there are a lot of indirect impacts. I mean, uh, especially within, uh, let's say mid-sized and small-sized countries, it is very important if you do have a club uh, that is competing on an international level and is successful, uh, because it's bringing more value into, uh, into the country as well at the end, uh, then you do have uh, another opportunity to discuss with the broadcasters, with the, uh, with the partners uh, on site, with the naming grant partners. Uh, I, can, I can fully admit that uh, uh, with Within Slovakia, with uh, changing the model of the league, uh, starting uh, a lot of new projects, uh, making our clubs uh, more competitive in European competitions, brought us uh, a reasonable, reasonable growth uh, in last uh, in last three years, uh, which is significant, significant and will be uh, much higher in coming years. So we really uh, see that uh, it brings uh, a lot of added value, uh, and we do feel that. Uh, uh, with current ecosystem, we, we can for sure uh, discuss, adapt, uh, maybe uh, we have implemented uh, on the European level, uh, uh, third level of competition, uh, conference league, which is very important for uh, our clubs. You see, we constantly changing the environment uh, to make it better. And this is the way we should do. But uh, bringing a totally different uh, approach uh, within a, uh, within a uh, very close to uh, European, uh, European market would totally damage what is working. So this is something that we need to uh, understand and keep in mind, because uh, once we do this step, we can never return back. Uh, yeah, it's a one-way decision, and it's a good point, no? Um, to keep in mind. Um, and I think uh, another element that we need to bring up is that uh, Icarus back in 2021 uh, in their uh, European sports model, um, was a stat that said that 85% of, of a survey they ran out uh, found that the concept of promotion and relegation was very relevant to them. And Michal, you were mentioning this before. This speaks to the uniqueness of, of the model in Europe, no? Versus um, models in other regions of the world, right? So. Peter, why uh, or would this implementation of a Super League imply that European football loses its uniqueness? First of all, I think that uh, the principle of competing is an indispensable part of the human nature. So when we launched the first football clubs 150 years ago and then leagues and competitions, and the indispensable part to be the winner, to be promoted, or to avoid the relegation. And I think that this principle should be, should be preserved. Uh, not only because in the FIFA statutes, uh, this principle is in writing established like a, a part, uh, let's say, mandatory for all our regulations. So uh, the league, uh, which is closed, is losing those parameters, and then it's having all the negative aspects which we were discussing before. So I'm very much in favor that we have to have this system, the ecosystem of the pyramid, uh, where are the, the clubs are promoted, relegated, uh, the players are promoted to the better clubs. Uh, there is a, a financial solidarity, because I'm very much convinced about the, the principles of the financial solidarity and central marketing. Uh, and then, uh, without this, we cannot uh, we cannot use the system. Yeah, and, and I think it's related to a point that I was mentioning in the previous panel uh, about the, the the power of unpredictability and and how it benefits broadcasters. No, and and I think that's some some of the elements of the game that we need to consider. That that's also also what what fans actually want. Which at the end of the day, uh, there's there's some. Um, obligation towards those funds that are supporting the clubs, no? Um, and Jean Francois, we one of the things that we were mentioning throughout this uh, interesting conversation is um, that this goes beyond just football and it goes into culture, it goes into the lifestyle of the people and effectively 
it goes into politics. Um, and you've also uh, studied this matter, um, and, and I want to understand um, from your perspective how much political support is needed to preserve the essence of some of these principles and values we've been talking about. Well, the political support is crucial, of course, but uh, it's not going to come at no cost for sport, um, for football. I mean, the, the relationship between, let's say, because I think it's, it's a European matter at the moment, uh, so of course the local politi politics is important, but the, the European Union should give the, the way and local politicians will maybe follow. And the relationships between uh, the European Union and sport when it comes to the cases that he had um, is, is kind of clear now. Um, the specificity of sport as a sector is recognized. Uh, that means that sports can be exempted from respecting the, the law, uh, but the, the, this is going to be um, analyzed case by case. And so sport needs to prove that it's a specific sector that deserves a specific treatment. And uh, to me, the, the, the challenge is to show that sport is a public sector, is a public good, because it creates a lot of externalities uh, in health, in citizenship, in inclusion, etc., etc. And those externalities, by definition, they're not monetized. So when you put one euro in sport, you only look at what it creates in, in, in mon monetary uh, matters, and that's not enough, because you, ca you don't measure what you don't spend in health, in the health system, in, uh, in, in the police, in, in a, a lot of other uh, sectors where you save money if you spend in sports. And so sports needs to work on measuring, on assessing what are all those social impacts, those externalities that sport has when it, when it and, and it's not about football, it's not about elite, it's grassroots, it's any kind of sport. And if sports show that it's such an important way of, uh, of developing a, a culture that we, that we like to live in, I'm sure the politics is going to follow. And that's pretty much what, you, what is um, written in the decisions written by the courts so far. But it's a challenge. For, for sport, for Europe, because not everyone is, on, is in the same line. Uh, so I, I think everything is written down. Sports needs, needs to do better in governance, for example. Um, but still, the challenge is, is, uh, is next. <laughs> it's an interesting point, because what we were discussing before about the direct and indirect impact into the game actually goes into the whole lifestyle and culture of the people. You know, in employment, health benefits, etc. No. So, thank you for that answer, Jean-Francois. And um, we have a few minutes left, and you know, I want to give everybody here in the audience the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, but I did want to finish with one question that I want to ask all of the panelists here. Um, and the thing is, the European football model has proven to be a success. Uh, but we must understand it's far from being perfect, as anything in life, no? So I want to understand from each of you, and I don't know, we can start with you, Peter, and we can just go this way. Um, how would you improve the current model so that it benefits football for all in Europe? Uh, I would divide it to the internal and external communication, uh, because we in football, I think we are very much convinced of what we are trying to defend and protect, but still there are some spaces for improvement for explanations and, uh, uh, let's say, instructing and explaining. And there is an ongoing process uh, to speak to the federations, to the clubs, uh, even the not directly involved in the threat of the Super League, why the whole system uh, is under danger uh, if the Super League would be established. And then external communication. Uh, and it's, it's very good that we overcame the borderline of sport and football and we went to the politics because with the back, backing of the EU, European Parliament, European Commission, uh, the hearing in July at the European Court of Justice shown how important was the presence of 20 or 21 countries uh, directly at the hearing uh, to explain the importance of the whole sport social model in Europe because of the, all the parameters we were discussing many times here. So any area, politics, business, 
media has to be has to be tackled uh, to fight for our system. Thank you, uh, Thomas. I don't know if you want to win. UEFA has prepared a new system uh, since 2024. Uh, this system uh, has been prepared by the more clever people than me. Uh, but uh, I would uh, recommend, uh, because I'm deputy of uh, middle or small league, uh, that uh, direct promotion to Champions League, not uh, to 10, in rank, UEFA ranking, but uh, for example to 15, and uh, increase of uh, money for non-participating clubs. Thank you. Those are very concrete actions. So, Michal. So I, I would just maybe connect on when, when what Thomas said. Uh, that's absolutely correct, and I totally admit it. Uh, I would say the key word would be solidarity, because I do think that uh, uh, we are so strong as the let's say, weakest uh, in, in the group. So meaning if uh, the gentlemen from clubs were speaking about it, if you want to build a sustainable environment, you need to really uh, keep an eye on uh, the whole ecosystem, meaning you need to support uh, everyone in the ecosystem uh, to make it competitive, to make it uh, unpredictable, which is very important for uh, the partners on the other side, for the broadcasters. And uh, therefore, I would say that you need to invest uh, into uh, making it really uh, a working environment, which is very important. I'm personally, I'm a huge fan of uh, American sports. I'm watching NFL uh, every weekend uh, when it is played. However, this is a totally different uh, ecosystem and it's totally different to uh, European sports. Uh, because what we are speaking about, uh, we are uh, building this ecosystem here for uh, uh, tens of years, uh, meaning coming to hundreds of years maybe, and uh, it is based on, uh, on, on key pillars, and uh, these key pillars uh, we, need to, uh, we need to keep in mind and uh, not to uh, throw them away just uh, because of, uh, uh, I would say, because of uh, the revenues uh, in the first instance. And, and thank you for that answer. It's a good point. I think we need to consider that context is different. That there may be models, but, but really understanding the context where we're, where we're in, in terms of the culture, in terms of the sport competition, and everything, really, it's what determines um, the current model. Jean-Francois, to finish off with your opinion. Yeah, just, just to, to, to remind football that he, if you want to be better protected by the European Union, for example, you will have to, to prove that football is not only an economic activity and that it's, it's bigger than that and that it's, uh, it's, uh, it has externalities, it has a, a social impact on, on any kind of people that is following, is a fan that is practicing, etc. Et and then European Union is going to expect you to show that you take into account this and that you understand that, that what constitutes sport as an economic peculiar good which has all those social impacts. And um, you, you will have to prove that you're not only considering sport as a revenue uh, generating business, you know? So, so that the, the ball is in your side of the court and prove them that you, that you understand this. And I'm sure that, I mean, I'm sure, I'm positive that uh, you're gonna get better protection and that the model is gonna stand and maybe the threats are not gonna be um, st like keep going on, going on uh, until the end of the days. Yeah. Well, thank you for that answer and I want to thank each of you, Peter, Thomas, Michal, Jean-Francois, for, for these answers and these insights.